No, we're looking skeptical. It's um, impossible to know even where to begin on this. Um, no, um, the green issue, this is a great opportunity for anti-war uh, lobbies to collide their two pet things, which is global warming and uh, the military, and to claim now that the military might be responsible for global warming. I mean, uh, I, I can't see it's even a serious story. Alex? Well, I, I mean, I think it's a, it's a fair point. If you are concerned about uh, environmental damage, if you're concerned about uh, uh, oil spills and, and, and things like that, I mean, yes, the, the militaries of the world pollute. However, I mean, it would be stupid to deny that. However, uh, the militaries of the world, I would say, particularly those of the West, are essential uh, pieces uh, for, for defending those states, for defending our way of life. If it wasn't for our militaries, uh, we, we wouldn't be here now. And so, uh, you know, it's quite important, I think, that we maintain our military capabilities yeah. uh, um, exactly for them. That's not a problem. But I think we have to start thinking about other forms of security. You and I are not armed, but we're sitting here in a perfectly pleasant sort of way. Maybe we can be a bit rude to each other. We want to be, but we're not going to kill each other. Why don't we think about security in other ways than being armed to the teeth against somebody else? And that is the normal condition of human life, but it's not one we well, practice internationally. It's so internationally. abnormal that it's never happened. It happens all the time. Alex, what, all the do time. You, what do you have for us? Uh, what I'm bringing to the table is something that uh, is, is ignored. Uh, I, I say it's ignored because I'm interested in Russia. But uh, 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 President Vladimir Putin of Russia has tried to strong arm uh, in the past few days Ukraine, saying that they need to extend the lease of the, Ukraine, of the Russian Black Sea Fleet base in Ukraine uh, past 2017, which is already very long. And now, uh, this may not seem all that uh, interesting or important to a lot of people, however it is, because it, as the EU and NATO expands into that area, we could find that by 2017, when the, Ru the Russians may have the Black Sea Fleet, the biggest naval fleet within the EU, within EU waters, if Ukraine is to become a part of the EU before that or around that time. So I think that's significant. Douglas? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. So I hadn't followed it. So. But you, do you think it follows the general pattern that we're seeing with Putin at the moment? And well, I suppose so. I mean, um, it, Putin, in my mind, is, is a rather hard leader to, to read. Um, and it, I think it's rather hard to tell what his ambitions at this point are. He gives off rather, rather different uh, uh, signs. I mean, obviously, he wants his nation to remain looking like a global power of some kind. Uh, it doesn't look that way to me from the outside at the moment. And much as you know, the Russian military force is uh, decaying beyond repair, as it were, and is looking rather like an old battleship that's not really worthy is to get to environmental see. pollution, in fact? Uh, I don't think that's causing it. <laughs> well, it, do, it does. I mean, the, the Russian Black Sea Fleet is one of the yeah, of is course, a huge contributors to environmental pollution. If that's well, how about right? letting Russia into the EU and inviting them to join NATO? I mean, if Turkey's coming in, why shouldn't Russia? Let's talk about uh, why do we have to have a permanent back of our minds that there's an evil empire to be dealt with in the new situation of today, whatever of the past? Well, why surely there has to be reforms in Russia. I mean, you, you would consider it written in the current way. Reforms in Poland, reforms everywhere, including here. But, uh, well, I don't think they're very interested in being admitted. I think that's the... Well, let's, uh, let's try. Let's see. Um, why not? Um, <laughs> well, I think we have, in fact. We tried that in the 90s. And well, the we Russians pushed the NATO right up to the borders, didn't we? Um, which is a fairly hostile thing to have done to you. Well, there's, uh, a, there's a NATO-Russia partnership, and the idea well, is to have eventually Russia part of NATO. It's them that they don't well, want it. Who knows where NATO's going to go next? I mean, no one ever thought of Afghanistan as a place for NATO when NATO started. Israeli entry. Is so, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Let's have a global NATO. Why not? While we're at it. Could be interesting if it works. Yes. Douglas, your story, please. Oh, uh, it's a very different story. Um, I thought that uh, one of the stories of the week, which uh, will not get much coverage elsewhere, but is uh, being covered a little bit in the Dutch media at any rate, it's a very small-scale thing, I suppose, for people outside of Holland, but I think a very large problem for democracy, which is that uh, Geert Wilders, who um, runs a very small party in Holland, uh, um, which uh, has been ostracized in recent years. Geert Wilders himself, uh, much like Aaron Hesjali, has to spend his life under um, armed guard in, in, in security, has to live on army bases, has an exceedingly unpleasant existence. In the campaigning for next month's elections, uh, two of his supporters uh, in the north of Holland were putting up posters and were severely beaten by local Muslim Morocco lads. Um, this might not seem like a big thing, but I think it is. I think it's very worrying that the process of, process of democracy cannot safely go on in a European country without people fearing for their lives for supporting a political party which is not extremist, which is simply supporting a man who is much hated by large proportions of that country. Mm. Is, this a, is this a problem for European democracy? Uh, is it well, a, a, 
for telco things to come? Well, it may be a problem for democracy. I mean, I think to, to some extent it's a clash of cultures. I mean, you see this in, in, in lots of countries where you have a significant Muslim populations, uh, and it seems to be coming to a head. I mean, you have the veil issue here. In Denmark, you have uh, more conservative parties being voted in because as, as a reaction uh, to, to, you know, this clash of cultures. Uh, uh, you have, for example, uh, lately in Denmark, uh, the issue of public swimming pools uh, where the uh, uh, women, Muslim women would, uh, are essentially not taking showers before going into the swimming pools and going in there fully clothed. And this is extremely shocking to Danish society, obviously, that go in there uh, almost not clothed. Yeah. And uh, so I think that there's, there's all these frictions. And, 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 um, and school children in Denmark who uh, swim in different pools, so the girls and boys in different pools, because Muslim girls can't swim with infantile boys. Right, right. civilization. Well, I think our job is to build bridges and everywhere we can. These are bizarre things, of course, but I know all sorts of Muslims who actually wouldn't agree with the sort of thing they were talking about. After all, in Northern Ireland, we had Catholics and Protestants beating up each other for voting in the wrong place or voting for the wrong candidate. It's not a, an Islamic affair, unfortunately. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a tendency which I think is to be deplored anywhere it starts. And, uh, and it is a threat to democracy. People should be able to vote freely for a candidate they want to. Absolutely. I agree with you, Douglas. There we are. Marvellous. Painful. 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 <laughs> Painful. That's true. I think, Douglas, you're actually speaking about this, aren't you, next Monday in That's uh, right, yes. the New Culture Forum. Right, a quick scoot through our regular uh, global risk analysis. And this week, uh, three countries have an increased risk factor. Uh, Pakistan, Mexico and Fiji. In Pakistan, thousands of pro-Taliban demonstrators have been marching in cities in the northwest following government airstrike against a madrasa um, operating the front against militants. Um, the demonstrators have called for an end to Pakistan's alliance with the U.S. And in the war on terror and for a jihad on America. In Mexico, President Fox has had to call in riot police to disperse teachers and left-wing protesters who are taking control of the city centre of Oaxaca. The protesters have been engaged in a five-month campaign to uh, get rid of the governor there who they accuse of corruption and indeed authoritarianism. Um, in Fiji, the government has failed in an attempt to remove the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Um, the Commodore uh, Balamanarana, who has actually been critical of uh, government policies and actually threatened to uh, invoke the resignation of the Prime Minister based on amnesties for the coup of 2000. The government tried to replace him, but the replacement actually said he'd, he'd back the military chief. So um, expect problems there. In good news, however, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo saw a very orderly presidential runoff on Sunday. There had been fears that the two candidates would engage in violence if there were irregularities in the polls. And um, lastly, um, having joined the nuclear club, uh, North Korea has actually agreed to return to six-party talks, and uh, these will be commencing shortly. And uh, the six countries involved are the two Koreas, the US, Russia, Japan, and China. They last met in November 2005. Bruce, what stands out for you amongst those uh, stories? Well, I suppose the, the Taliban in Pakistan does, because that's a critical country. It's a nuclear-armed country, and... Uh, I think a regime like that in Pakistan would be a disaster. But, uh, so that's, to me, the most internationally worrying about the stories you've just related. Alex, do you agree? I, I would agree, actually. Well, obviously, North Korea is, is extremely worrying, but I th and I think it's a bit silly that we're uh, you know, clapping each other on the back just because they came back to the talks that they've been doing for the past 10 years, and now they've already gotten a nuclear bomb. But um, Pakistan is important, I think, because you have this regime that is essentially refusing to take care of its own backyard and refuses to let uh, uh, the United States do it for them. And so there's real problems, I think, in that, that part of Pakistan. And Douglas, it is a problem, isn't it, the, uh, the Pakistan yes, situation? Yes, of course. I mean, it's been a problem we've all known about for the last five years. I remember I think that on the day after 9-11, uh, Dick Armitage was seeing the Pakistanis and, uh, and, and they, he said to them, no, 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 history starts today. So when they said, oh, no, we've got a long problem going back many years with, with Taliban and so on, they said, no, history starts today. Sadly, uh, history only seemed to have begun that day. But Pakistan have just signed an agreement, did they not, with several of the frontier uh, tribes peoples, which seem to... Seems to make some north. difference, but I mean, the problem always is with whether or not, with knowing whether or not the ISI, for instance, the Pakistani Security Service, is really on our side. And I mean, every time you can ch trace, it's very interesting, trace the number of the, when an al -Qaeda, top al-Qaeda guy is given up by the ISI. It is always at a crucial moment when the West is lying something. They know exactly when to put somebody in our, in our direction. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate it. And thank you for watching. And join me again for another Worldview next week and send in your comments. Thank you.